Welcome back to the Accessible Art History YouTube channel. For this week's video, I'm adding another video to my five must-see masterpieces series. I think these are a fun way of getting to know a museum and its hit list. This time around, I'll be focusing on the Capitoline Museum in Rome. Not only does it have a fantastic collection of ancient Roman art, but it's also considered to be the first museum of the world. So to learn more, then keep on watching. The Capitoline Museum was founded in 1471 by Pope Sixtus IV. He decided to take some of the Vatican's collections and donate it to the people of Rome to form a public collection. About a century later, Pope Pius V added a ton of new works to the museum. This was during the height of the Counter-Reformation, and he wanted to get as many pagan statues out of the Vatican as possible. The next major expansion and renovations came in the 1870s. This was when the Italian peninsula was united under the new Italian kingdom and national pride was at an all-time high. Today, the Capitoline Museum is one of the most popular tourist destinations in Rome. In fact, about 4 million people visit it and the Forum each year. This makes sense since both sites are near the center of the city. The museum sits above the Forum on the Piazza di Campidoglio. Amazingly, the geometric pattern of the piazza was designed by none other than Michelangelo. In the center, there is a replica of the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius. This piece is one of the most enduring symbols of Rome. If you want to learn more about it, then listen to the podcast episode I did. It's linked in the description box below. Part of what makes this museum so great is the fact that it's a collection for the people, by the people. Although the Roman Empire is just a memory, the pieces held here remind citizens of their own fascinating past. And through this, they are able to share it with the world. One quick note before I dive into my five choices. I already covered one of the most famous, the Capitoline Wolf, in an episode of Art History Minute. I've linked that video up in the eye and in the description box below. This statue, on first glance, may just look like a depiction of Hercules, but once you explore the backstory, you will see that it has come to represent the reign of one of the most disliked emperors in Roman history. Commodus ruled over the empire from 180 to 192 CE. He was a son of Marcus Aurelius, and people hoped that he would continue his legacy of a tough yet prosperous rule. But boy, were they wrong. Commodus not only spent a lot of time outside of Rome on his family's property, but he also devalued currency and believed himself to be a living god. This was a big no-no in ancient Rome. Emperors were usually deified, but not until after their death. Commodus became so hated that he was assassinated. At first, conspirators tried to poison him, but he ended up vomiting it up. So they took a more hands-on approach. Literally. Commodus died by strangulation in his own bathtub. Another one of Commodus's faults was the fact that he associated himself, quite literally from the likes of the statue, with the famous hero Hercules. Commodus likely commissioned this work around the same year that he was assassinated, in order to feed his ever-growing ego. The viewer can see his face, it matches other known portraits, quite well along with the three main attributes of Hercules, the club, the apple, and the skin of the Nemean lion. By showing himself this way, Commodus was trying to associate himself with one of the greatest heroes in mythology, but instead it came off as a pompous act of self-promotion. Today, ironically, it's considered one of the best examples of Roman imperial portraiture. Our next work is called the Esquiline Venus. It was found near the Commodus Hercules sculpture in an excavated garden in the Forum. Most art historians believe that this work was a 1st century CE Roman copy of a 1st century BCE work. Some even go as far to say that it was commissioned by Emperor Claudius. This statue stands just below life-size and is made of fine marble. Although she is missing her arms, it's easy to see the motion of her body as if she is about to step forward. There are a few interesting details of this work, and they all point to ancient Egypt. Firstly, the robe that is casually draped on the vase seems to be of an Egyptian style. Secondly, there is a snake decorating the vase that has been identified as an Egyptian asp. The species has gained infamy as the snake that Cleopatra used to commit suicide after her defeat at the Battle of Actium. These details have led many art historians to believe that this piece was modeled after one of Cleopatra from the time of her affair with Julius Caesar. Constantine is widely considered to be one of the most important Roman emperors. Not only did he move the capital to his own city of Constantinople, but he also legalized Christianity. In order to honor him, a colossal statue was erected in the Basilica of Maxentius in the Roman Forum. When fully intact, it would have stood at about 40 feet high. Today, only parts survive, the head, legs, and hands, but the main part of the body was likely made of wood, brick, and bronze, and would have likely been destroyed long ago. 
but since the other ones were made of marble, they lasted much longer. Examining the pieces creates an interesting story. Firstly, the head is a fairly standard depiction of Constantine. His hair is cropped close and he is clean shaven. He has a strong brow and an assertive gaze. This stylized depiction of an emperor was common during this era and matches other known images of him. It shows the strength of his imperial role. However, if you look at the hands and feet, they are much more naturalistic. There are gestures and veins carved into them. This gives the work a more human feel, bringing the emperor to our level. The Dying Gaul is another piece that is a Roman copy of a Greek original. It dates from around the 1st century CE and is one of the most emotional works in the Capitoline Museum's collection. The sculpture captured the moment when a soldier from Gaul, modern-day France, realizes that he is going to die of a stab wound. We know he is a soldier because of his sword and shield that lay on the ground next to him. His muscles contort with pain and we can almost see the life leaving his body. This sculpture is a study of contrast. To the Romans, Gauls were considered barbarians. They wore their hair differently and had an entirely different social structure. But in this piece, the artist chose to depict the dying man in the heroic nude style. This harkened back to the age of Greek heroes, whom the Romans greatly admired. It is an unusual choice for a barbarian, but it shows the respect that the Romans had for their adversaries. The final piece I'm going to be discussing in this video is called Spinario. It depicts a young boy sitting down, pulling a rather large thorn out of his foot. Surprisingly, this work is made of bronze. As you may have noticed, nearly all Roman works to survive in the modern era are marble. Bronze was simply too valuable and too difficult to make, so pieces were often melted down. But thankfully, this one did make it. In fact, it is believed this work was one of the founding pieces of the collection, as records of its existence date back to the 12th century. What is so striking about this work is the delicacy of it. The figure appears to be quite young, maybe around 10 years old. His legs are a little too long for his body, and we can imagine his pain as he pulls the thorn out of his foot. For centuries, this work had another name, Il Fideli. This means the faithful one in Italian. The legend states that this little boy ran so fast to deliver an important message to the Roman Senate that he injured himself doing so. These are only five incredible works in the collection of the Capitoline Museums. This institution is dedicated to showcasing the amazing pieces of Roman history, and I highly recommend you check out their website to see them all.